Is this uh, model being picked up, your model that we're just learning about now, is it being picked up by universities and schools? Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's being picked up. I think it's way too early for that. It's just being found out about, mostly. Now, I've had a lot of students. I've had actually a fair number of physics graduate students get real interested in it. and They think it's terrific and all like that. But I don't know when you define being picked up. That's probably when somebody starts making official comments about it, and it's... it's uh, it's really hard to do that in an academic situation. So, no. so what, do you, what do you think is holding that back? Just Oh, it's just the inertia of the culture. I mean, we have, through all the physics departments of the world, you have this tremendous um, reluctance to let go of Newtonian objective reality. And it's not just that they're, you know, they're being hard-headed or that they're being in denial. It's that they don't know what else to do. You know, it's like Einstein worked at it for 25, 30 years, and he came up with a big goose egg. What do you do with that? You can't work in a university for 25 or 30 years and not publish anything and not get fired. See, that's not on your career path to success. So we had all these brilliant people. You had Born, you had Heisenberg, you had Einstein. They're all writing these papers and say, what we need to do is find a new paradigm. Because without a new paradigm, it's like it's an interesting fact, but you don't know what to do with it. You can't operate on it. You can't derive things from it because you don't have a model. You don't have a theory that makes sense of it. So that's their problem. They don't know what to do with it. And when they don't know what to do with it, they start saying things like, nobody can understand it. It's impossible. You see, that gets them off a hook of being responsible for figuring it out. So it's just this inertia. We've gotten to the point that it's been, it's too hard to do. And in the beginning, it was really too hard to do because concepts of digital simulation, back in Einstein's time in the 1920s, digital simulation wasn't on the map. It wasn't a concept that they could deal with. It was not in their reality frame. So they couldn't reach out and go, aha, that's it, you know? This is a virtual reality. Virtual reality were words that didn't make any sense. They were nonsense back in the 1920s. So now that we have gradually, over the last, what, three or four decades, Virtual reality is like, oh yeah, I understand that. And suddenly these concepts are starting to become available. You know, they're starting to become things that people can think about because they're now, they're now here. So that's just new now. You know, 30 or 40 years is nothing in the history of you know, concepts of reality with a culture. And you know, that takes a long time to turn over. But it's growing. The good news is that you have people like Fredkin and you have people like uh, you know, Whitworth and the rest of them, and they're publishing papers and they're publishing in referee journals and science, in science journals, and they're saying virtual reality is, is the way to go. It's better. It's better physics. And you know, if they can come up with a good model, then other physicists will jump on that bandwagon and it'll go. Well, you know, this is a good model. This model to them would have one big downside, and that's that it also explains metaphysics, the paranormal, and all kinds of other things that for the last, you know, 80 years they've denied its existence, and you look kind of foolish if you deny something for 80 years and then turn around and say, oh yeah, I know it was like that all the time. You know, so it's a little hard. There's a lot of inertia going in one direction, and turning it around is going to, it's like turning around a freight train, you know, it's going to take a little while to do it, but I'm hopeful. I think this theory will probably gain credibility at one time, sometime in the future. The reason I believe that is that it answers the mail. It explains the unexplainable. I mean, there's all kinds of unexplainable scientific experiments out there, the double slit just being one of them. Pair Labs has a whole bunch of things. So does uh, Frontier Science out of Tulane University. They have a whole bunch of things. There's been a fair number of, of, of uh, researchers, besides the, you know, the parapsychologists like, you know, at the... Uh, Duke University, they had a big parapsychology department for a long time. There's lots of people who have done research on things that are strange because they're interested. They want to know if it's real. And they'll do the research, and the research will say, yeah, it's real. And now they say, okay, now what? You know, what do I do with this information? Where does this take me? You know, what can I publish? What can I, where does it take my career? And basically, it goes away after a while because there's a dead end, because there's no theory that they can grab hold of and say, yes, this explains it. See how this ties everything together? It's just like it's this weird fact that's out there, like the double slit, and you ignore it because there's nothing you can do with it. This actually gives them something they can do with it. They can take virtual reality and they can understand why these mysteries work. Suddenly it solved a whole bunch of problems. 
It's easy. You end up with theology, too. I mean, that's impossible. How does science give you theology? It's unthought of, you know, unheard of. So it's going to take a while. This is a very big step. As far as, as, far as paradigm changes go, you know, we talk about a paradigm shift. Well, this is going to be like a paradigm earthquake. You're going to, you're going to take... You think of the paradigm shifts from flat earth all the way up to where we are today, that's going to be a bump in the road compared to this paradigm shift. If they get to this paradigm shift that I'm talking about, it's going to be a major gut-wrenching, culture-twisting, mind-bending shift, and it isn't going to happen fast. Something that big is going to happen slowly, and it's going to take a long time because it's going to have to build very, very slowly, but at least it's, you know, it's a start. And I find one of the good things about it is I find young people relate to it real easily because young people have been doing virtual reality basically since they were, you know, eight years old. And the concept of virtual reality being, you know, this being a virtual reality doesn't shock them at all. They go, oh, cool, good idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they like, they like that. You know, it's not like, that's crazy, which is what you get from an older generation that sees virtual reality as just a computer game. They can't imagine it like this. But you see, it does explain a lot of things. So anything that explains all the data, eventually, I think, is going to win out. Same with evolution. When, when Darwin first published evolution, they made parodies of him. They had pictures of him as a monkey, you know, a monkey body with his head on it. And, you know, it was a big joke, you know. We evolved from monkeys, you know, and Darwin was a monkey and everybody laughed. But it explains the data. There's so much data that it explains that eventually science says, yeah, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to, to refute something that explains all the data. I think this will eventually be like that too, but whether it takes 100 years or not, I, won't, I don't know, you know how long it'll take. I think it'll go faster than, everything moves faster now than it did before. I'm hoping that within decades we might see some significant push into the universities and other things where people start taking this seriously. But my thought was, I came to the conclusion that it's a bottoms up kind of thing. It's not the right idea to start at the top, which means start with the university professors and the guys who are doing research in, in consciousness. It's not a good idea to start there and try to convince them and then let that flow down. It's much better to start at the bottom, talk to you guys, other people, and let it bubble up for a couple of reasons. One, all the top guys doing things have won big reputations and big careers on the line. If anything changes very much and they missed it, it doesn't look good. Secondly, they're very, very busy. Anybody that's at the top of their game gets you know, way more input than they want because everybody wants to show them their, their idea. So they don't have time for much other than what they're doing. And lastly, things that are imposed from the top down. When the top says, oh, this is a great idea, we should all you know, move to this. Ideas imposed from the top down don't tend to last long and don't, have to have, don't tend to have a very deep impact. They're easily ignored. Time goes by, years go by, and they, they go away because they were dependent on the people, you know, the experts. When the experts go away, that goes away too. If it bubbles up from the bottom and you have a groundswell and you have a few hundred thousand or a few million people who think, you know, this is, this is the way, this makes sense, this is good, then suddenly the experts have to pay attention. It doesn't matter how busy they are. They have to pay attention. They have to deal with it. And that's a lot harder to chase away. That will then grow and grow and grow and I think become something. So I believe the bottom up is the, is the correct solution if you really want to make a long-term change in the way we see reality. It's got to start at the bottom and let the people drag the scientists kicking and screaming into the game. <laughs>